Good afternoon. I'm Kel Dutani. I'm Natasha Riga Jones. I'm Mia Dowdy, and welcome to Warwick Congress Weekly. This week, we'll be talking about South Korea's take on cryptocurrency, the shutdown of the US government, Trump's speech at the anti abortion rally, and the collapse of Carillion. We'll also have an update on Germany's coalition government, a selection of financial news from the past week, and Macron's visit to the UK. We'll be, discussing, we'll be discussing relations between Russia and Ukraine, relations between Turkey and the Kurds, and finally, the Colombian immigration crisis. But first, we're going to explain a bit about Warwick Congress, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. Warwick Congress is one of the fastest growing student-run initiatives in the UK that aims to unite the disciplines of finance, economics, politics, and law into a single platform. We host events throughout the year, culminating in our conference in February, We also aim to provide students with various networking and careers opportunities, such as through seeking career seminars and that will be given at our conference. Tickets are on sale now, so don't miss out on hearing speakers including Michael Lewis, the CEO of E.ON UK, Gavin Hewitt, the BBC's Europe editor, and 18 more. Membership of Warwick Congress is free, so sign up on our website at www.warwickcongress.com. Our hope is that Warwick Congress Weekly can inform our listeners, and if you have any questions, queries or opinions, then please message in and let us know. You can do so by going to www.radio.warwick.ac.uk and pressing the message tab on the top right corner. You can also tweet us at raw1251am. For our first story of the week, we head to South Korea, where a ban on cryptocurrency is on the cards. South Korean legislators are currently discussing whether to implement a total ban of cryptocurrency market of the cryptocurrency market in the country in a bid to crack down on what it sees as market frenzies. The government also believes that this new type of market can be exploited and can be a conduit for crime. On Thursday, Choi Jong-koo, the head of South Korea's Financial Services Commission, said while responding to questions in Parliament that the government has been considering shutting down all local virtual currency exchanges or just the ones who have been violating the law. This statement has come after a lot of confusion surrounding cryptocurrency recently in South Korea. Earlier in the month, conflicting statements had come out from different government entities. On January 11th, the Ministry of Justice reportedly confirmed a plan to shut down all cryptocurrency exchanges, but this was denied by the presidential office soon after, saying nothing had been finalised. How has this uncertainty affected the cryptocurrency markets in South Korea and worldwide? Prices have been falling ever since South Korea made their intentions clear last week, on Wednesday, and Bitcoin is down 18%. Casting our eye on last month, it was trading at nearly $20,000 per Bitcoin, but just two hours ago, it was only at $10,324, showing a huge decrease in the price. In fact, over the period of last week, it lost a quarter of its value. However, these price fluctuations are not necessarily totally because of the proposed South Korean ban. Bitcoin, Ethereum and Ripple, as well as other cryptocurrencies, are known for their volatility, with 10% rises and falls in a day very common, with the reasons behind them not fully known. So if this ban did come into effect, what would this mean for South Korea? Well, South Korea is often seen as the third largest Bitcoin market in the world, behind Japan and the USA, with over a dozen cryptocurrency exchanges. There has been lots of investment into Bitcoin in South Korea due to a slowing economy and growing unemployment, with people looking for new ways to make money. So much so that there has been growing public opposition to the proposed ban. In fact, over 200,000 people have signed a petition against the proposed ban. So if a ban was put in place, the South Korean government may risk losing the next general election by angering these many cryptocurrency supporters. Perhaps South Korea could be left behind by banning cryptocurrency since it's becoming a very lucrative market. Or the bubble may burst, as many expect, with South Korea being affected less by the consequences. Meanwhile, the US government hit headlines this week as it experienced its first shutdown since 2013, following a disagreement on the budget bill. Disagreement arose over a number of key policy issues, leaving Congress without a deal to keep funding the government as midnight struck on Friday, with the dispute between Republicans and Democrats being most fierce over DACA, an expired Obama-era program which protected nearly 800,000 young illegal immigrants in the country from deportation. President Trump and Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer were reportedly close to resolving the issue during a meeting on Friday, but the deal fell apart over continued disagreement on the issue of immigration, with Schumer saying, negotiating with this White House is like negotiating with Jell-O. 
The government is now set to reopen, though, after a spending bill that ended the shutdown passed the Senate by a majority of 81 to 18 and the House of Representatives by 266 to 150 on Monday, with Trump having held the end of the government shutdown as a big win for Republicans. However, the deal is by no means a long-term solution and will only keep the government funded until the 8th of February in the hope that Congress can reach a longer-term budget agreement in the meantime. This is the fourth temporary measure that has been passed since October as Capitol Hill continues to fail to agree to a longer-term budget. Speaker of the House Ryan Paul said, I know there's a great relief that this episode is coming to an end, but this is not a moment to pat ourselves on the back, not even close. So what did the shutdown actually involve? Well, federal law requires agencies to shut down if Congress has not appropriated enough money to fund them, with the White House having stated that 1,056 members of the Executive Office of the President would be furloughed, meaning that they could stay at work for no longer than four hours to engage in shutdown activities, like setting out of office messages or explaining how to carry out functions to colleagues who were not furloughed, while 659 employees considered essential continued to report to work. US troops, including those in combat, potentially will not be paid for the hours they work during the shutdown, with many national parks, zoos or museums that were closed now beginning to be reopened. The shutdown also affected the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, meaning that American citizens wanting gun permits had to wait until the shutdown was over. So who is exactly to blame for the shutdown? Well, President Trump and legislative leaders in both parties have blamed each other for the shutdown, with Trump and his fellow Republicans having sought to pin the blame on Democrats. Democrats in the Senate were largely unified in voting against a measure that would have kept the government open without settling the DACA issue. Consequently, Trump has suggested that Democrats were embracing illegal immigration and tweeted on Saturday, This is the one-year anniversary of my presidency, and the Democrats wanted to give me a nice present. Hashtag Democrat shutdown. Meanwhile, Democrats have accused Trump of endangering hundreds of thousands of young American immigrants, with Joe Kennedy III, a Democratic representative from Massachusetts, saying, For all those dreamers out there, our message for each and every one of you is that there are those in our government that see you, that hear you, that believe, and know that this country belongs to you. President Trump has also hit headlines for his speech defending the right to life at an anti-abortion rally. President Trump Trump addressed the March for Life rally on Friday. He has become the first sitting president to speak live via video at the rally in Washington. In the speech, he criticised US abortion laws and vowed to defend the right to life. The March for Life is an annual rally protesting both the practice and legality of abortion, always held in Washington, D.C. In the past, Presidents Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush have delivered remarks at the march via telephone broadcast. In his speech, broadcasted from the White House, President Trump stated that, Under my administration, we will always defend the the very first right in the Declaration of Independence, and that is the right to life. He told the audience that, Americans are more and more pro-life, you see that all the time, and he proclaimed in the 19th of January as National Sanctity of of Life Day. The month marks one year since Donald Trump banned the US government from giving funding to health groups that offer abortion counselling. So what's uh, President Trump's history of supporting the pro-life movement then? Well, decades before becoming president, Mr Trump actually said he supported abortion. In an interview in 1991, Trump was asked if he would ban late-term abortion, to which he responded that he was pro-choice in every respect. During his campaign for presidency, he explained that he had evolved on the issue. Vice President Mike Pence, who introduced Mr Trump, called him the most pro-life president in American history and added that he would restore the sanctity of life to the centre of American law. In the speech at the rally, Trump criticised Roe v Wade, the 1973 court decision that legalised abortion in the US, saying it has resulted in some of the most permissive abortion laws anywhere in the world, He said that the laws that allow late-term abortion in some US states are wrong and have to change. So while Trump has condemned the current US abortion laws, this week has also seen some updates on his push for the travel ban. So can you tell us a bit more, Mia? Yes, that's right. The US Supreme Court has agreed to decide the legality of President Donald Trump's latest travel ban. The third version of Mr Trump's travel ban targets people from six Muslim-majority countries, affecting travellers from Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria and Yemen. The directive also prevents travellers from North Korea 
and certain government officials from Venezuela from entering the US. The court is due to hear arguments in April and will rule by the end of June, but it has already allowed the policy to go into effect while legal challenges continue. So for our next story, the collapse of Carillion, a major construction company and outsourcing giant, has signalled one of the biggest corporate failures in recent times. Can you tell us more, Kevil? Well, Carillion has moved into liquidation after talks between the firm, its lenders and the government uh, failed to reach a deal to save the UK's second biggest construction company. So what's actually caused the collapse? Um, well, Carillion, whose debts total over £1 billion, relied on lucrative contracts, which after initial optimism, proved much less lucrative than originally thought. One of the major problems was the soaring costs of public sector construction projects. The Royal Liverpool Hospital, due to be finished by March 2017, had to be put on hold as faults were found in the building. On top of this, earlier this year, Carillion slashed the value of contracts by £845 million. The collapse threatens to deprive tens of thousands of workers of their livelihood, with early estimates suggesting 30,000 workers will lose their jobs. Last week, we touched upon Angela Merkel's future after a 28-page blueprint was agreed with the Social Democrat Party to form a coalition government. What's the update this week, Tash? Well, on Sunday evening, the Social Democratic Party voted to start formal negotiations with Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Union on creating a coalition government. Martin Schulz, leader of Germany's Social Democratic Party, urged the party to approve the coalition. Schulz said, Europe is waiting for a Germany that takes responsibility for Europe and that acts decisively. Without the Social Democratic Party, that won't be possible. His plea was ultimately heard as the Social Democratic Party narrowly approved the start of formal coalition talks that are due to commence this week. So is this good news for Merkel? Undoubtedly, as this is her last chance to realistically form a coalition government. However, she's not out of the woods just yet, as the vote will have to be approved by all 440,000 Social Democratic Party members, with widespread opposition amongst ordinary members of the party still sceptical towards a Merkel-led coalition. One particular faction, the Social Democratic Party Youth Wing, is worried about a repeat of the party's last two coalition governments formed of the Christian Democratic Union, as the party has gone on to lose a substantial number of votes after these occasions, with their vote falling to 20.5% in September's elections. If the Social Democratic Party do vote down the deal, Merkel could theoretically lead a minority government or try once again to form a coalition with the Greens and Free Democratic Party. However, the most likely possibility in that instance would be a snap election, which would further plunge the country into political crisis. Now for a selection of the financial news from the past week. The broader markets have shown only a modest weakness during US government shutdowns in the past, with the S&P 500 falling on an average of 0.6% historically over the period of closure, um, with many corporate names being affected by fallouts. For example, defence companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing and Raytheon were warning about contract costs, contingency plans amid uncertainty over the military budget, so they await the February decision in earnest. The sixth round of NAFTA negotiations kicked off on Sunday in Montreal, with many observers believing that these could be make-or-break talks. President Trump called the trade agreement a bad joke in a tweet last week, and the goal of the Canadian Mexican officials now seems to be shifting towards making sure there's enough progress that the US administration won't back out of the negotiations. The euro is heading higher following a crucial vote by Germany Social Democrats to enter a formal coalition with Chancellor Angela Merkel's Conservatives, ending four months of political uncertainty. The gains may be capped, however, after Emmanuel Macron said France would probably have voted to leave if the EU had held leave the EU if it had held a referendum in a similar context to Brexit. Continuing with the euro, the a eurozone. Finance Minister's meeting in Brussels yesterday led to the tentative sign-off on the latest set of the Greek government's debt overhauls, agreeing to disperse 6.7 billion euros in aid over the coming weeks. While some of the terms attached to the latest bailout review still remain to be completed, 95 out of the sum of the 110 policy conditions had been met as of Sunday. Southeast Asian governments are poised to introduce taxes on e-commerce sales, as they look to claim their fiscal take from one of the region's most buoyant sectors. Singapore, Thailand and Malaysia are among the countries considering doing so, putting online retailers on a level playing field with their physical peers. 
Saudi Energy Minister Khalid Al Fali urged global pro- oil producing nations on Sunday to end their cooperation. Sorry, to extend their cooperation beyond 2018 at a compliance meeting between OPEC and non-OPEC members in Muscat in Oman. He said, This doesn't necessarily mean sticking barrel by barrel to the same limits or cuts, or production targets country by country that we signed up to in 2016, but assuming stakeholders, investors, consumers, and the global community that this is something that is here to stay. And finally, nearly a year after it was promised, Amazon's first automated grocery store promising no lines, no checkouts, no registers, is open to the public in Seattle. Technology detects everything consumers are taking or returning to the shelves and charges their account when they walk out of the store. The concept raises questions about job creation and destruction by Amazon, especially if the model is implemented at Whole Foods, who employ over 89,000 people in the USA alone and is owned by Amazon. Now, last week, Theresa May prepared for President Macron's visit to the UK, and Mia's got an update for us. Prime Minister Theresa May welcomed French President Emmanuel Macron to the UK on Friday in a bid to usher in a new Anglo-French relationship after Brexit, with May reportedly treating Macron to a gastropub working lunch as well as a parade in his honour at the Sandhurst Military Academy. During his visit, Macron stated that France would look with kindness on Britain, making a decision to halt Brexit. With his enthusiasm for Britain remaining in the EU, coming after the European Council president, Donald Tusk, said the country could still change its mind, telling the British people, our hearts are open to you, and stating that if Britain did want to remain in the EU, then it should be able to do so. His counterpart at the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, went further by arguing that the UK could also opt to rejoin the EU if Brexit went ahead, using the little-known treaty clause Article 49. Macron also stated that Britain can secure a bespoke Brexit trade deal, but warned there would be a trade-off with with the preconditions that Britain would have to accept for full access, including freedom of movement, budget, contributions and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, all things that May has ruled out in the long term. During a press conference with the Prime Minister, Macron also stated that child migrants seeking to escape Calais and come to Britain will have their claims processed within 25 days, with the leaders announcing a new treaty designed to ease the suffering of some of the thousands of people camped near the French port, who currently wait six months to have their cases settled. Britain has, also, has already announced it will spend £44.5 million to boost security at the French port, with this money being used to help pay for fencing, CCTV CCTV cameras and detection technology in Calais and at other ports along the channel, building upon previous security work in the area, which has which has helped reduce illegal attempts to enter the UK for more than 80,000 recorded attempts in 2015 to just over 30,000 in 2017. Macron stated that the agreement will enable us both to have a more humane approach to these people and to be more efficient, while also making trade through the channel ports easier. Now, Tash is going to give us the latest on the new Ukrainian law in relation to Russia. The Ukrainian parliament has passed a law defining areas seized by separatists as temporarily occupied by Russia. The eastern territories of Donetsk and Luhansk have been declared temporarily occupied, and MPs pledged to reintegrate them back under Kiev's control. The Russian Foreign Ministry sees this as Ukraine's efforts to denounce Moscow as an aggressor country and views it as evidence that Ukraine is preparing for a new war, according to Russian media. Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko welcomed the new bill, saying that it would help to restore control of the East by political and diplomatic means. Can you tell us more about the crisis in Ukraine? Well, in 2014, the conflict in eastern Ukraine erupted in the weeks after Russia annexed Crimea in April and has seen more than 10,000 people killed. Crimea became the focus of an east-west crisis after Ukraine's pro-Moscow president, Viktor Yanukovych, was driven from power by violent protests in Kiev. The Minsk peace deal was introduced in 2015 to put a stop to the hostilities and end the conflict. The US and the European Union said the peace deal was a condition for lifting sanctions against Russia. However, clashes have continued since and advances for political settlement have been stalled. So how does this new law affect the 2015 Minsk deal? Well, Russia's foreign ministry has warned that Ukraine's passing of the bill effectively puts an end to the Minsk agreement. 
The bill contains no reference to the 2015 peace deal that obliged Ukraine to pass legislation offering autonomy to the separatist regions. The bill backs a ban on trade and a transport blockade of the East that Ukraine introduced last year. Of all the documents issued by separatist authorities, Ukraine would only recognise birth and death certificates. A senior member of the Russian parliament, Alexei Pushkov, called it a paradox for Ukraine to have diplomatic ties with the aggressor. Now heading to Turkey, where a ground attack on Arfin was launched on Sunday morning. Turkey launched a ground attack on the Kurdish-held city of Arfin in Syria in order to eliminate the Kurdish rebels on the doorstep of the Turkish border. Despite international criticism, Turkey have made this large offensive, crossing over the Syrian border to face the Kurds. President Erdogan made a statement saying that, God willing, in the coming days, we will continue the operation to purge our southern border from terror. He has dubbed the Kurdish rebels as terrorists and vows to tear them down. What are the international consequences of this offensive? Well, by launching this attack, Turkey have further frayed tensions with the West. Significantly, the Kurdish rebels are US-backed and have received major funding, training and weapons from the US-led coalition in areas. Um, the coalition had been training a 30,000-strong border force to protect Kurdish areas, which included the area of Arfin. This angered Turkey as they, as they linked these Kurdish rebels in Syria with the Kurdistan Workers' Party, who waged a four-year insurrection in Turkey and have long seeked independence from the state. In response to the attack, a U.S. State Department spokesperson said, We urge Turkey to show restraint and ensure its military operations remain limited in scope and duration, and scrupulous to avoid civilian casualties. From this, we could see a further distancing of Turkey by the US and the EU if they continue with the attack. So what's happened since Sunday? Well, so far there has been a significant bombing of the city by the Turkish Air Force. Turkey have targeted militia targets and it has resulted in 10 dead in the city. The Kurds also launched a retaliatory shelling program which has killed three on the Turkish side of the border. Turkey have stated that they wish to create an 18-mile buffer zone into Syria, so taking off in and eliminating the Kurdish rebels a key for Turkey to do so, so many more casualties are expected. For our final story of the week, we head to Colombia, where it has been reported that 550,000 Venezuelans have fled to the country. Colombia says that the number of Venezuelans fleeing a severe economic crisis to live in Colombia has increased by 62% in the last six months. Migration officials report that those now living in Colombia are mostly illegal. The influx is putting pressure on the government, especially in border areas, to provide the migrants with food, shelter and medical care. Officials say a million Venezuelans have registered for for a migration card that allows them to come and go across the border to buy food and other products scarce in their own country. On an average day in 2017, More than 30,000 Venezuelans used the card to enter and leave Colombia, across a border where smugglers thrive, selling increasingly unavailable but heavily subsidised Venezuelan products to Colombians. Of the Venezuelans living in Colombia, 126,000 have legal permission to stay, including some 69,000 who have taken advantage of a humanitarian visa introduced in July. So how has the international community responded to this crisis? Well, last week, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the UN was willing to send more aid to Colombia to help with the growing influx of migrants. But despite this, there's been no long-term arrangement to deal with this crisis. Here's a summary. Here's a summary of all the stories you've heard today. South Korea are considering a ban on cryptocurrency, but they may face serious opposition from the public. The US government is expecting its first shutdown since 2013, or was expecting its first shutdown since 2013, as Republicans and Democrats failed to agree over DACA, an Obama-era program which protected nearly 800,000 young illegal immigrants in the country from deportation. They've now put in place a temporary agreement, and there will be further further, uh, negotiation over policy, and a new agreement is set set to have a deadline of February. President Trump has criticised US abortion laws in his speech addressed to the March for Life rally in Washington. He stated that, under my administration, we will always defend the very first right in the Declaration of Independence, and that is the right to life. In other US legal news this week, the US Supreme Court has set a date to decide the legality of Trump's travel ban against travellers from six Muslim-majority countries.
The court will rule by the end of June. Construction giant Carillion has gone into liquidation, threatening thousands of jobs. Carillion ran into trouble after losing money on big contracts and running up huge debts of around £1.5 billion. Germany's leaders have taken a crucial step towards breaking a deadlock that has prevented the formation of a new government since elections four months ago. The centre-left Social Democrats have agreed to start formal coalition negotiations with Chancellor Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats party. Theresa May welcomed French President Emmanuel Macron to the UK on Friday in a bid to secure a new Anglo-French relationship after Brexit. Macron shared his enthusiasm for Britain remaining in the EU, with the two leaders agreeing to a new treaty designed to ease the suffering of child migrants in Calais, reducing the wait time of claim processing from six months to 25 days. The Ukrainian parliament has passed a law defining areas seized by separatists as temporarily occupied by Russia. The Russian foreign ministry sees Ukraine's efforts to denounce Moscow as an aggressor country as evidence that it is preparing for a new war. They have warned that Ukraine's passing of the bill effectively puts an end to the 2015 peace deal called the Minsk Agreement. Turkey have launched an attack on the Kurdish city of Arthin, despite US warnings against doing so. Colombia's Migration Authority have announced that the number of Venezuelan immigrants in Colombia increased by 62% to more than 550,000 people during the last half of 2017. Tickets for our conference from the 9th to the 11th of February are on sale now, so buy yours to see world-class speakers including Basil Scarcella, the CEO of UK Power Networks, Jean-Francois Mazaud, the head of private banking at Societe Generale, and Gavin Hewitt, BAFTA and Emmy award-winning BBC Europe's news editor, and many, many more. Buy your tickets now at www.warwickcongress.com forward slash tickets. Becoming a member of Warwick Congress has never been easier. With exclusive interviews, articles and careers events for our members, don't miss out on the benefits that Warwick Congress membership can provide. Sign up now at www.warwickcongress.com. You've been listening to Warwick Congress Weekly. Our podcast will be back at the same time next Tuesday.